we don't come out for a single round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, um, I'm very excited about this. So I'm, 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 I'm excited to have a chance to, to, uh, to, to talk about the work that, uh, that we've been doing for a bunch of years now. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I mean, we've probably been talking about doing this for, what, three or four three. years? Um, and you know, basically, uh, the conversations that, that we've had um, have helped educate me on um, the parts of the business model that, that, are, that are really important uh, in, in the news industry, what it would need to look like for us to do something. Um, it hasn't just been our conversations, you know, conversations with Marty at The Post, with Jonah at BuzzFeed, and a lot of other folks over the years um, have helped shape my thinking on this. But, you know, just to give maybe a, a few minutes up front on, on kind of from, from my perspective what, uh, why I think this is important in the journey to, to have gotten here. Um, I do have one question. <laughs> what took you so long? <laughs> <laughs> After the last few years, <laughs> I now have an appreciation that that is the nicest thing he could have said. <laughs> Because that means that he thinks that we actually did something good. As a journalist, <laughs> as a journalist, you only ask what took so long when you actually have some agreement with what the thing is. Otherwise, the question would have been immediately diving into why, why are you still getting all this stuff wrong. Um, so I will take that as a compliment. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I've believed for a long time. It, it, it's very clear that the work that that you all do and. Uh, in the news industry and journalism is is obviously critical for democracy. You know, I, I care about um, giving people a voice uh, so that people can share their own experiences, so that they can share their opinions on things. But you know, at the end of the day, in order for that to be valuable, um, there needs to be a a, a strong and, and free press that's act and people actually going and doing the work of uncovering um, the truth, right? And in, in the and the um, important stories that people uh, ha have kind of the basis and the, the ground truth to talk about, right, and, and, and debate and, and have that at scale. Um, so it's no secret uh, that, you know, the internet has really disrupted the news business model. And I, I just think that every internet platform has a responsibility uh, to try to help uh, fund and, and form partnerships to support news. Now, the thing that's been really challenging that, that has made this take longer than I think either of us would have, would have wanted um, is that we've had this funny dynamic in, in our community where you know, people come to Facebook and our services because uh, you know, it's a social network. They want to stay connected with their friends and their family and communities. And, and we get consistent feedback from, from the vast majority of people on our services that they want to see uh, more content from friends and family and less other stuff. So it's created this odd dynamic where, on the one hand, um, you know, we personally and, and kind of the values of our company, we really value journalism. Certainly, we've had a lot of conversations with folks who have um, pushed us quite hard to, um, to, to kind of show more of the content, to um, enter into uh, relationships where we can fund more of the content creation. Um, but it just was this, this kind of uh, odd dilemma where, um, where while we wanted to do that, we were just getting consistent feedback from our community that, uh, that they generally want to see more from friends and family and less of other stuff. So that, that kind of created an odd dynamic to, um, to then be setting up a relationship where you'd be going and paying for content that people were saying that they actually wanted to see something else instead. So the thing that's changed in the last few years is that we've gotten um, these secondary tabs to work, right? So for the longest time, newsfeed was basically synonymous with Facebook. That's kind of what, what everyone, what the experience was. And, um, and I wasn't sure if we were going to be able to build other tabs or other experiences within the app that could get meaningful engagement. And what we found now is, you know, we've built the marketplace tabs that people can go and buy and sell things. Um, you know, we built the watch tabs so people could watch videos. And it took a little while to get these things off the ground. In the beginning, it wasn't clear that they were going to be successful. And still today, you know, the majority of people don't use them. Uh, but what we found is that even if you know, 10 or 20 percent of people in our community um, really want a dedicated experience uh, in, in, in an area, that can still be something that you know, tens of millions of people in the US use and hundreds of millions of people around the world. And that certainly can be quite meaningful and worth doing. So uh, that's what we've been working on, basically, is, is working on a, a dedicated 
tab for journalism, high quality uh, journalism um, in, in Facebook. And this is gonna be the first time ever that there is a dedicated space in the app that's focused on, on high quality journalism. Um, in order to help uh, curate the, the top things that are, that are in there, um, we're not only doing it algorithmically, we're also, you know, we've, we've put together a team of, of folks who have experience in journalism and, and a background in this. Because um, I don't think it's something that can just be done by computers. Of course, we have personalization as well in there, um, but at least for the top stuff, um, that's going to be done uh, by people with a background in the space. Um, provenance, which I'm sure we'll get to, is, is just an incredibly important thing that you've pushed me on for a while. Um, and then, of course, on, on a financial basis, this is going to be the first time that, we've, that we're forming um, long-term uh, stable relationships and partnerships with a lot of publishers. And you know, I know we've done we've done a lot of um, experiments and tried different things in the past. And and I, I know, frankly, that that's also created a lot of thrash in the ecosystem when you know we tried something and it didn't end up working out the way we wanted. Uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to wait until we could prove that we could get these other tabs to work before uh, trying to do this in news, because I, I wanted to make sure that this could be a, a, a positive experience and one that we could commit to for the long term. So now, you know, for the first time, we're making multi-year um, financial commitments and hopefully helping to make a, a kind of long-term sustainable um, business model uh, that, in a way that we can be in business together. So that's kind of been the journey that we've been on. I'm, I'm really excited about this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm curious from, from your perspective, I mean, you, you've been on this journey with us and, and, and in, in your business uh, as well. I'm, I'm curious kind of what, what it's, you know, what you've seen, what this journey has been like from your perspective. Yeah, thank you, Mark. It, it, Mark's had quite a week and uh, normally the... Um, <laughs> normally this is the, like by far the best thing yeah, I, I get to do. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to, about to say, normally the amuse-bouche comes at the start of the meal, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, look, a short soliloquy for me, and, and then we get to interrogate each other. But it is a pleasure to be here with Mark uh, to announce a partnership, not just with us, but with uh, many media companies, and a platform that actually is significant for the future of journalism. Look, as many of you know, uh, News Corp has been rather outspoken uh, in the quest for a premium for premium journalism. Obviously, as a media company, we have a vested interest in that cause but it is also a cause with a social purpose, which is to protect and enhance professional journalism and the profound social role that it plays in this country and far beyond. As an executive, uh, I have been able to make the case persistently and puckishly because of the enduring support of Rupert and Lachlan Murdoch. There were risks involved. I remember a conversation a couple of years ago uh, with a media executive who said that he very much agreed uh, with our content critique, but was, quote, standing behind a very large rock with a pair of binoculars to see what happens to you. <laughs> the perceived potential punishment would be that an algorithm... That was not me. That was not you. <laughs> <laughs> it was... Oh, no, you have to... Come and see me later and I'll tell you. <laughs> the perceived potential partnership or punishment would be that an algorithm would make your journalism disappear or that it simply wasn't worth the digital distress of agonising powerful players. Now, it's obviously been a difficult decade for journalism. Pew estimates that the number of journalists working at US newspaper mastheads has fallen 47% during the past 10 years. Digital news startups have struggled to survive, let alone thrive, in a dysfunctional landscape that, for example, with First Click Free, actually punished premium journalism. A little corporate contemplation is also appropriate. Publishers and journalists are definitely not absolved from responsibility and need to be held to account for flawed strategies. Some have been too tardy in understanding that how readers read and when they read has fundamentally changed and is still evolving. We have to develop a coherent teleology of technology. But the landscape itself must change. And that was an imperative for us, and that is what makes the Facebook announcement so significant. It is a powerful precedent that will echo around editorial departments. Of itself, it begins to change the terms of trade for quality journalism, both in establishing the principle of payment and in allowing news organisations a clearer opportunity to generate advertising revenue on their terms. In the past, clickbait became the king of content. An egregious aggregation was the norm. Premium content had been commodified 
and the hierarchy of journalistic excellence was torn asunder. Mark deserves genuine credit for this digital Damascene moment. There has been a bit of banter between our companies. Just a little. <laughs> We've had occasional disagreements, a little content contretemps. <laughs> but he has been consistently thoughtful on the subject of journalism. His individual introspection has obviously been a catalyst for an institutional response. Great journalism not only enhances the internet, it is crucial for the functioning of society, for the protection of rights and for public accountability. Great journalism will only be sustainable at scale if there is a fundamental change in the digital ecosystem. This announcement is an important step on the road. It's far from the end of the journey, but it is certainly a moment to ponder and recognise. All right, well, uh, so I'm... Uh, I'm <laughs> We're pondering. I agree, yeah. I agree. Um, so um, maybe you could talk a little bit about you know, some of the specific points that you've really focused on and pushed me on over the years. I mean, provenance has been you know, one, of the, one of the key things that, um, that I think we've talked about for years, right? The, the importance of, of um, people being, being able to know uh, where the information is coming from, um, so that they can establish that base of trust. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm curious to hear how you, how, how, how you would describe this, um, you know, after all the conversations yeah. we've had. Well, uh, uh, provenance. Um, Mark, unfortunately, uh, some digital executives uh, seem to think provenance is a region in southern France. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not you, obviously. But <laughs> uh, and, and protecting and projecting provenance is a crucial part of ensuring the future of journalism. Uh, the news landscape is a little lunar at the moment, uh, and, and not just for traditional newspapers. And a couple of examples, uh, digital startups, which don't have the traditional fixed costs, are also on life support, the lucky ones. Verizon Media Group, I took a $4.6 billion write down. Uh, the Univision properties are being tossed out of the boat. Uh, quality sites like Quartz apparently generate uh, far more losses than they do revenues. And even clever curated UGC like uh, Fansided is down five goes five goals to nil at half time. So uh, we can ruminate on the remains, but th it's important that there be f fundamental changes. And, and the, the, one of the issues is that this has been obvious for such a long time. Uh, back in 2007, when I was the editor of the Times, and it certainly at that time had absolutely nothing to do with Facebook, uh, I was asked to give evidence to a House of Lords committee, and, and I'm not pretentious enough to claim prescience. And my observations were simply based on perceptions for my day-to-day -day role uh, as an editor. And I'll, I'll read you some of the evidence that I gave to the August Lords. Facts are incidental, if not accidental, on the internet. And the problem we have as a society is that there is a significant number of people who have grown up in a different information environment, surrounded by much more information, but whose provenance is not clear. The rumours will be believed, the fiction will be thought as fact, and the political agendas, among other agendas, will be influenced by interest groups who are coming from some quite strange trajectory to issues based on collective understanding that is founded on falsity. And that's still an issue for us today. And that's why what Facebook is doing is so profoundly important. And it, it's interesting, at least for us, to, to get a sense of the debate that went on with your team uh, about how to get to this point in history. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, you know, I think going back and, and, and forth on, um, you know, we, it, it's, it, I think it, it has taken us a while to get an appreciation um, for what the right ways are to support high quality journalism. Um, for the first decade of the company, most of the efforts that we had were focused on newsfeed itself, right? Which it makes sense. I mean, that's the main kind of way that people use the, the service. Um, and there, I think we have some levers, right? I mean, we worked on things like instant articles um, where we could help serve ads that, that can be quite effective. Um, we worked on a number of subscription tools to, to help uh, different publishers grow subscriptions. Um, our approach in this has always been, by the way, to um, you know, and all these subscription type tools to make sure that 
uh, publishers get all the revenue, right? We don't take a cut. We're extending that to the work that we're doing on Facebook News now, um, which I know is different from some of the other policies that other tech platforms have. But again, uh, our approach here is we think that this is content that people want to see, so it makes our services better, so we benefit that way. And we want as much of the revenue as possible that gets generated to go to publishers to help fund high quality journalism. Um, so that's not something that we feel like we should be taking a cut of. So we've been working on that for a while. But the fundamental architecture in Newsfeed um, made it a little hard to do a lot more than that. Right? It's, uh, fundamentally, all the content that's in Newsfeed is, is coming from people that you've either said that you're, you want to be friends with or um, or pages that you follow. So there hasn't been a lot of kind of discretionary space in there to, to put in um, other content that we just think might be high quality. That's not kind of the logic of how the product works. And then, of course, there's this issue that I was talking about before um, around the general feedback that we get from our community on wanting to you know, make sure that, that Facebook and Instagram stay uh, social services uh, first and foremost. I mean, there's a, a lot of places that people can go to get different kinds of, of content, but there aren't that many places online that you can go to uh, see what's going on with, with your community and your friends. And you know, that's the feedback that we've gotten. So now, the, the fact that we've now kind of have more confidence that we can build up tabs outside of newsfeed, and even if it's not going to have billions of people using it, if we can get to you know, 20 or 30 million people in the US using it, um, over years, right? It's going to take a while. This is going to start very small, um, but I, I, I do think that if we, you know, continue the, the partnership um, and you know we continue, uh, hopefully, doing a good job of listening to the ideas and the concerns that, that folks raised us, um, then I think we can probably get to you know maybe 20 or 30 million people over over a few years, even if it starts um, small initially. That by itself would be very meaningful. So I think it's all of these lessons that we've basically. It's. Um, I can I can understand why to some degree it would be frustrating to, that it, that it would that it took us a while, but it's um, you know, I think over time the conversations we basically were able to internalize more of what mattered, and then when the opportunity presented itself, when we had confidence that we could deliver and build a tab that we think could be long term sustainable, um, we built enough of a shared understanding of um, of what would need to go into that to hopefully make it work um, that we at least felt comfortable making long-term multi-year commitments um, to, to be on this journey together and to, and to pay for the content to do that. Mm. Mark, I know the communities are, are important. Uh, they're essentially they're the, the basis for, for Facebook, depending on how you mm -hmm. uh, define community. And one, one of the issues that, that obviously affects a lot of regions in the States is that their community papers are struggling. So can you do something, can you involve, can you frankly pay local papers as well for their content because even yeah. even Warren Buffett who thought he was buying at the low and was, would somehow revive local papers found the challenge beyond him uh, and it was beyond him uh, because the, the the economics are not working the economics not working on the subscription side and the economics in the open advertising market are dysfunctional yeah so what can be done for local papers yeah so I agree. I think that this is this is an incredibly important area. Um, and when, when I was talking before about the disruption from the internet, I think in a lot of ways local papers have probably been hit the hardest. Um, so there are a number of things that we're trying to do here. Um, for a, a lot of the metro areas around the U.S., we are in, we have uh, formed long-term financial partnerships around this news tab, and we're going to include that content. Um, we also one of the other products that we're working on is we, we are also building this separate tab that we call Today In, which is, is basically uh, you, you can go to it and you can see um, all of the different content that's happening on Facebook um, in your local town or, or, or in your region. And that's, it's not just news, it's you know, communities that people have formed, it's events that people have on Facebook events, it's posts that people are, 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 are putting out, it's you know, if, if the local police department has a page or there, there are um, pages from different civic institutions then we'll include content from there that that's that's getting some engagement and this is another product that is um, it's early but it's going quite well and and certainly including local news in there and forming a financial uh, partnership around that is one of the things that we hope to do and then as a third thing I mean earlier in this year uh, we also announced a 
a $300 million commitment um, to journalism and, and helping um, a number of publishers, but a special focus on local news um, to grow their subscription business model, especially, and to do work on, on that. So you know, I, don't, I don't pretend that any of these steps by themselves are going to be enough. Um, I, I don't think that you know, we as one company are going to be able to you know, solve this issue. I, I think that can be more broadly replicated across the industry and that as um, we build products, you know, whether it's Facebook News or Today In, as they scale, um, we'll be able to increase our financial investment over time and, and, and hopefully others will, will kind of follow uh, the model that we're helping to set up. And I think that with all of that together, then, um, then I think we, we have a shot. But, but this is certainly a big problem. Um, I do think local news has been hit particularly hard by all, by all these changes, and in a lot of ways, it's some of the most important content for um, for kind of holding our, our society and democracy together. Mm. And uh, just over a year and a half ago, the Facebook exec team came to, to News Call, yeah. uh, spoke with Rupert, mm -hmm. uh, saw what HarperCollins does with books, what uh, the opinion journal uh, editors do, what the news journal editors do, and this, the distinction is very clear between church and yeah. state at, at the Wall Street Journal. How much of an impression did that experience have, not only on you, but the members of your team? I mean, I think it was pretty profound. So, you know, every year I try to take our management team to a company that we admire that does something quite different from us so that we, we can just immerse ourselves and learn. And this is a, a, what was it, two years ago, uh, maybe November, three years ago? November 2017. Um, yeah, okay, so yeah, a couple of years ago. Uh, and, and I mean, you guys set up a, just a, a wonderful day where we basically got a, a, a sense of all of the different businesses that are part of, of News Corp and Fox. And um, the point that you're saying was one of the ones that really, um, that, that, that um, stuck with me is like, Internally at your organizations, um, such a clear distinction between news and editorial, mm. and, um, and or news and opinion. Mm. And one of the one of the takeaways for me though is, you know, as someone who, who you know sometimes watches TV, but probably not as much as, as maybe I should, or maybe the right amount. I, I don't know. Um, it's, I, I, um, think, I think you should read more newspapers. Yeah. Well, right. you know, that's um, it's. I, as, as a consumer of this stuff, it's, um, it actually, it's, sometimes the, the stuff blends together. And even despite how rigorous I, I think your organization and, and others are at making sure that they, they are kept separate. And it just, that really crystallized for me that there are a number of things in running Facebook that we think are completely different and that we have different processes that internally it's like these things definitely seem like they, they, they should be, like they're completely different. And you know, whether it's our policies around ads versus our policies on organic content that people post, it's like, oh, those are handled by completely different parts of the organization. Obviously, they're very different. No, I just think a lot of times the stuff blends together. The world doesn't see it, even though you have these internal distinctions. Um, so just, it just shows that you need to be even more rigorous about doing it internally. Um, that, that was a really, that was one of the important takeaways. But I, I think across the board, just seeing um, how much, well, first of all, how different the different media types are and how different the types of, of people who, who go and do that work is. Um, you know, I think it's, it's sometimes this gets simplified down to, okay, like we're engineers and then there are people who are journalists who, who do content. Um, it's obviously a lot more nuanced than that. Um, you know, I, I think if, if you're operating at that level of simplicity, you're like actually probably really missing the point because like the, the stuff that is, um, that, that's going to be, you know, important in, in the different types of journalism are actually just extremely nuanced and getting a chance to see all that in, in one day um, was, was really valuable. And, and it did shape a lot of the discussions that our, that our team had. Um, and it helped crystallize a lot of the points that you've been driving home for me over the years. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and the, uh, obviously the, the dynamic debate that uh, we've been having, uh, it, it has been mostly focused on uh, paying a premium for preeminent content. Uh, when you look at the ad market, uh, there's, there's the Facebook ad market and then there's the open ad market, which mm -hmm. some people would argue is not particularly open. Uh, are you seeing changes there that a apart from people paying for the content, that, that other core element of revenue that historically has funded news organisations advertising, that, that that has reached an inflection point or could reach an inflection point in a way, whether it be a local paper or a national paper or a, an international website, uh, that there's 
more of a chance of more of the money going to new science? Yeah, so you know, I think the basic ingredients in, in the formula of what we're trying to do with the news tab are the, these two ways of, of doing monetization that you're highlighting. So one is by making it so that the content in the news tab is not, it's not that a person is saying, I want to follow you know, the New York Times or I want to follow Fox News, and then they get content from that. It's, it's, it's basically we're having a team of people who is choosing which content to show, which creates a relationship and a dynamic where we um, have a reason to go out and pay for that content, to go get it into the system so that way we can choose to show it, rather than just having it be, um, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm following um, you know, one of these uh, organizations, and, and I'll, I'll get to see whatever that, that publisher is saying. So that, that covers the paying for premium content piece. But the other piece, as you say, is making it so that the news organizations can run their own ads and can get all the money from that. Mm. Um, and of course, we want there to be multiple options. So you, know, you can run your own ads and, and get 100% get of the revenue. Or um, we, you can use our ad network, um, which we have. Um, uh, obviously, a lot of engineers and, and people working on trying to, to build um, really advanced technology for this. And, and there we give um, the vast majority of the revenue um, to, to, the, to the publishers and, um, in, in, in order to make that work. So I, I think that over time, we're going to need both. I, I don't think that the sustainable business model around news has ever been only one or the other for most players. Um, so I think we'll need to continue working on both. But, um, but I think what we've really unlocked here is a business model where it makes sense um, for both parties um, for us to be paying for premium content. And that, um, that just adds a whole new element on top of the advertising type work that we've been doing in, in, the, in the past. Um, I'm curious from, from your perspective, you know, you've, you know, in your career, you, you've worked, um, you grew up as a journalist, did a lot on the editorial side, and, and now, um, uh, obviously, are more on the publisher side and, and kind of running the whole, the whole business. It's easier to spend money than make money, I've discovered. <laughs> What's up? It's easier to spend money as an editor than it is to make money as a chief executive, except for you, but uh, at least in, in my case. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think my CFO might disagree with that. But it's, uh, um, if you look at how much we invest in kind of future technology stuff. But, um, but yeah, but so I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, you know, what do you see as the, as the trends there? I mean, you, you asked me about um, whether it's local or, or, or advertising versus advertising premium kind of pay for content mix. Um, what are, uh, I guess, the trends that you think are most promising? What do you think we need to get to in order for this to be um, a really good long-term sustainable model for the overall industry? Yeah, I, look, I started as a copy boy because I couldn't get a job as a cadet journalist. And, and it's interesting, my first job was uh, to put together two types of sandwiches. One was to go out and buy sandwiches for the real reporters. And the other was to put carbon paper between copy paper so that the real reporters could write stories. They were called sandwiches. Hmm. Um, and then a year into my career, I went on uh, strike with all other Australian journalists because of the introduction of... Um, computer terminals, which are essentially word processes. That was my first experience, my first disintermediating experience with new technology. Uh, but it's, it's stuck with you. It's stuck. <laughs> I don't bear a grudge. <laughs> uh, uh, that was literally 1980. Um, but I think, look, w one of the, uh, what was really reinforced at the Melbourne Herald, which is where I started, um, well, two, Two things. One thing that was really enforced, which I think for all the media managers in this room uh, should be an important issue, particularly in this, at this time, uh, I mean, to say I was naive at 17 is a euphemism. And I was worked in an environment, a working environment, that really helped me as a person develop a sense of place, uh, a sense of profession, a sense of identity even. Uh, and even though media, I mean, the cut and thrust, the com competition is relentless as it should be. Uh, but it's incumbent on every media manager to create an environment where young journalists, if we're talking about the future of journalism, where young journalism, young journalists get to realise their personal potential. And I think it's become obvious that too many uh, newsrooms were not that. Uh, and, and that's totally unacceptable because I was the beneficiary of the kindness of many women and men in that environment. Uh, and if, if, if individuals uh, are not confident, then they won't have the ability to take advantage of the professional opportunity. 
uh, we need as many, as many great professionals as we can master in, in the uh, journalistic community. Um, the other thing that's crucial for, for journalism and what was emphasised even in those early days at the Herald was uh, precision and accuracy, names, dates, places, prices, whatever. You had to get every detail absolutely right. And that accuracy imperative was amplified in the writing and editing. Uh, you, you were taught to let the facts fashion a theme and not to hand pick a theme and then choose selective facts to prove a point. And now look, we're all fallible, uh, but uh, as a reporter to have the objective of being objective, uh, not the objective of being subjective is imperative. Uh, uh, opinion journalists, uh, as we talked about before, are obviously meant to have strong, eloquent opinions. Uh, and there are two forms of church and state uh, in journalism, that between news and opinion, and uh, that between the editorial department and the commercial department. Uh, uh, in that sense, journalism is rather multi-denominational. Now, I've crossed the revenue Rubicon. Uh, <laughs> I'm sometimes tempted to go back, but... <laughs> but uh, it's tough. It's tough. Uh, but I, I do think that there, there is... We are at a crucial moment in the e-evolution of so many newspapers. Costs are being, costs are being cut in, at so many papers in so many places. And they're getting to the point, particularly in local papers, where even if they were to go in entirely digital and cut more costs, because you don't have the distribution, you don't have the newsprint, mm -hmm. uh, that the quality of the journalism would be so low that no one in their right mind would pay for it. Uh, and we have to turn this inflection point into a pivot point. Now, it's partly incumbent on us in the industry, but I, th I think that you and, and other digital companies can genuinely play a role uh, because we, we can see, no matter how clever Quartz might be, uh, it's on life support. Uh, and that's... Uh, the former editor was uh, an ex-Wall Street Journal mm -hmm. uh, digital specialist, extremely clever guy. He was uh, unencumbered uh, by tradition. He was contemporary uh, in his thinking. Uh, uh, and and that, that sort of existential debate is going on in, in so many places. So we have to move pretty quickly. I, frankly, I think you have to move as quickly as you can on local papers. Local papers themselves have to... I think they have to come and, uh, and seek Mark and his team out and, uh, and make the case for the, in their community that they're the paper that should re receive payment for, for quality content, because you can change that equation just a, a little bit, you move from an industry that's in decline and in some cities, in some locales, is in terminal decline, to an industry that can actually see a future. And that shift from pessimism uh, to optimism, I think, is genuinely a defining moment in our society. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's probably worth mentioning. We do already work with about 6,000 local papers. Um, so th we certainly want to do more. Um, but, you know, that's, uh, this, I think, is the next frontier, as you're saying. It's in, in some ways, it's easier to go work out partnerships and, and a business model with, um, you know, with the top you know, 200 publishers um, in the country or around the world. Uh, but, but figuring out how to, how to go work um, with a lot of the local ones is, is going to end up being really critical around the world, not just, not just in this country. Um, I'm curious to get a sense of... So I, I think through this conversation, we've kind of uh, played back some of the conversations we've had over the last few years. Um, I, I'd be curious to give everyone here a sense of what you plan on uh, pushing us on for the next few years. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I, I'd, uh, I, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm actually, I guess I'm, I'm personally interested in hearing this as well. Um, there goes my negotiating position. Yeah, well, you know, I'll use this interview for what I, what I can. <laughs> yeah, uh, look, I, it, it is, uh, I mean, for us as a company, obviously, it's Australia, it's, it's the UK that, uh, so in a self-interested perspective, that, that is going to be a, a crucial moment for us uh, to continue the, the, uh, consistently the, the, the theme, the pattern that you've so um, wisely set here. Uh, I, I do think around uh, understanding algorithms and algorithmic transparency is, is a crucial issue, uh, and, and not 
just for Facebook, but but more generally, because when you look in the advertising market, uh, algorithms, metrics were meant to bring transparency, but in the so-called open market, what we have is opacity. Uh, uh, and so ensuring that, that you know, as you develop algorithms, just ex explaining, because I think some of the, quite candidly, some of the discussion our teams have had is mm -hmm. when a change has been made and we see it in our metrics and uh, we'll, we'll ring someone and say, hey, you've obviously done something because we can see it in our metrics. Uh, and I think to, to use the relationships that you're now building with, you already have relationships, but your relationships with news organisations will be strengthened by these partnerships. Uh, and to use that uh, as an opportunity to get feedback so that actually you can the t your team can anticipate uh, a little more cogently the, the, the intended and also the unintended consequences of algorithmic change. Yeah, I think that that's certainly, I, I think we can do a better job of working with partners to have more um, transparency and also lead time about about what we see in the pipeline, so that way it's, um, you know, I think stability is a big theme, right? It's, um, you know, a lot of the experiments and, and things that we've tried to do over the last few years, um, you know, even when they might have been good things to try, if you, um, if, it, if it kind of just causes a spike, then it's really hard for, for all of your businesses to plan for that and make long-term investments. So I think um, just giving as much of a, of a view into that as possible. And um, I guess from, from my perspective too, uh, the work around AI and algorithms is probably one of the least understood parts of what we do. And I think there's probably, I, th I think we have a big responsibility to make sure that we communicate this clearly. And I also think a lot of your organizations will need to look into this and, and make sure that, um, that you communicate to the world very clearly about what's going on. But, but I think today, this is probably one of the one of the least understood parts of what we do. I, I'll routinely see people say, oh, well, of course these sites or these services are optimizing for you know, content, whatever is gonna make it so that people spend the most time on these services. And that's actually not true. Um, for many years now, uh, I've basically prohibited any of our uh, feed teams, either the Instagram feed or news feed and Facebook, from optimizing the systems to encourage the maximum amount of time to be spent. Um, what we do is we, we actually uh, optimize the systems for facilitating as many meaningful interactions between people as possible. And what, what we basically do is we have people come in and we show them all the content that we could have showed them. And we ask them, hey, what, which things would you have wanted to see? And which things like, of, of what you did see actually led to a real conversation between you and someone else? And then we try to take that firsthand data and, and, and kind of map it to other signals that we're seeing in the product and build an algorithm and a system that, um, that is going to lead to facilitating as many meaningful interactions across our services as possible. But this is obviously, this is a very kind of misunderstood thing that we do. Um, we actually made a very big adjustment last year. And this was in, in maybe the first or second quarter of the year. And um, where we, we made an adjustment to turn a bunch of the, the um, to tune a lot of the ranking a lot further towards um, emphasizing friends and family content, um, highlighting meaningful interactions. The result of that change was to remove about 50 million hours of viral video watching a day uh, from our services. So time spent on the services went way down. Um, it wasn't a thing that we really had, had much of a sense of beforehand. Um, of course, then you know, we went to go report our earnings the next quarter. And, um, and you know, that, was not, that, was, that, was a, that was a bad quarter. Our, our, market cap, <laughs> our market cap dropped by $100 billion in a day. Um, it was the biggest uh, drop in market cap in American business history. So that's a, you know, among the dubious distinctions that we get to have as a company, we get, we get that one um, as well. And um, I mean, just to put, it, put this in, scale, in, in perspective, I, I think that that drop in market cap on that day was two thirds of the total stock market drop on Black Tuesday before the Great Depression normalized for today's dollars. So not just, okay, not just the dollars were a, lot, were a lot less back then. So I mean, this is like a, a really big shift. And, and yet I, I, I still kind of see this narrative that, um, oh, we must just optimize for time spent. And it actually, it's, it's, it's not true, which I think means that we need to do a better job of, of making sure that people understand what we're actually doing, what, we, um, you know, what, what are the values that we're trying to optimize for, what guides these decisions, how these systems work, um, so that way, um, you know, there, there can just be more transparency and, and kind of in, in, in that 
uh, you know, the, the, the content that people see about that can be, can be accurate. Uh, just before we take questions, I w would agree with that very much so. And uh, the, the algorithm can't be an excuse, which we find not, not with you, but with, with some companies. And there has to be a blending of artificial intelligence and emotional intelligence. Yeah, yeah. Now, can we have some emotionally intelligent questions? Yeah, let's, let's <laughs> take some questions in the room. All right, Campbell, are you going to? Um, yeah, well, actually, I'm going to leave it tomorrow. All right, go for it. Kafka from Recode. Uh, you say it's important to support uh, journalistic organizations. You're paying News Corp and other publishers that are participating, but not all the publishers that are participating in the news tab. Why not, why not pay license fees to all the participating publishers? So what we're doing, at least to start, is you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of publishers um, are getting a lot of value from putting their stuff on Facebook already. Uh, but then there's an, an, a set of publishers who only are publishing a small subset of their content. So there are basically two things that these financial deals are based on. One is we want to make sure that in the news tab we have um, as wide of a breadth of content as possible, um, especially for the personalization part of things. So if someone's interested in cooking, you know, we want to make sure that we get the you know, great New York Times cooking content, right? So, or, or you know, wh whoever else is making that kind of great content as well. Um, so we don't just want to make sure that we want to make sure that we have a broader set of content beyond just um, what's already posted on Facebook. So that's one thing, is, is an API feed of that content. Um, the other area is th th there are, of course, a number of publishers whose business models are based on paywalls. And in order to make it so that some of the content can be visible to people on Facebook, um, and that that can actually be, be useful to people who go to this tab, um, we've had to structure specific relationships so that way some of the content can be visible from, um, from behind the paywall. Um, so those are the main things that the relationships are based on today. Uh, we're going to need to keep on working on this. Um, the goal over time is to cover a wider set of publishers. Probably the next set of, of, of kind of emphases is going to be local, as we talked about, and, and of course international. I mean, right now we're, we're really just we're launching this in the US uh, to start now. Uh, but we want to do something like this across the rest of the world as well. So we're, we've already begun um, working on uh, a, a lot of those discussions and, and partnerships and what those can look like. And you know, there are different laws and, and different um, kind of structures of the industry in different places around the world. So it'll have to vary a little bit, but I'm optimistic about doing that. Uh, but over time, the goal certainly is to cover as wide of a range as possible. Hi, thanks. Uh, Claire Atkinson with NBC News. I wondered if you could drill down a bit more on the economics. How are you deciding what to pay the different media companies? Is it based on clicks? Is it just one big guaranteed payment? Um, and then second question, how are you harvesting any data uh, behind what people read and sharing that with the partners or with advertisers? Sure. Um, so it's, it's not any kind of one metric, but in general, um, you know, it has, we value things like the amount of content that people are producing that, um, th that is high quality, um, the scale of the number of people who want to, who, who are basically subscribers or readers of that content or viewers of that content. Um, and, and then, of course, how, how much the different relationships, um, how, how much we're paying depends on the two things that I just said before in terms of what we're actually paying for, the API feed of all the content. Um, you know, some publishers are already, you know, Basically, uh, there's a lot of the content that they're not putting on Facebook, so there, there, there's um, you know more that we would need to do. Some who have a um, who who have a paywall model, um, we obviously need to make sure that the economics work for them and, and that they don't disrupt that business model. Um, so those are basically the factors that that go into this. Um, it's not a a kind of exact formula. Maybe we'll we'll get to that over time, but um, but it's all within a band um, based on. Uh, on, on kind of what you'd expect given those different factors. Um, on data, uh, we don't give data to advertisers. So that's not changing here. Um, that's probably one of the other very persistent myths about our company is people have the sense that somehow we're selling data. And that's just never really been a thing that we do. That's never been our business model. Um, so we, that's, that's, not, that's not the goal. Um, we, of course, want to make it so that when uh, a publisher has someone who is a subscriber and who's paying and has a relationship with that publisher that we can help facilitate um, them understanding 
um, what the activity of those folks would be across our services as well, as, as long as a person connects their accounts and logs in. Um, so there's, there's work that we need to do to, to enable that. Um, which I think could be quite valuable for publishers. We want to make sure that people have that that these that news organizations have an understanding of what their their subscribers are are uh, reading and watching across all the different platforms. I think that there's an opportunity to do that. Um, there are obviously some restrictions on on how to do that, uh, but that's an area that we're we're excited on working uh, about working on as well. Certainly on data, our impression is that we will have more data about our readers coming from Facebook with that new news tab because someone will click on a headline and and basically they're going to come to the Wall Street Journal. So we, we will know who that person is, will be in yeah. a permissioned way, and that will be the same for all other media companies who are participating. Right? Yes. Mm. Hi, Sarah Fisher from Axios. Um, do you have any thoughts about how your curators are going to curate news about Facebook itself? And I ask, because there's some outlets like Bloomberg that doesn't like Bloomberg to cover Bloomberg. Uh, so I, I didn't get the last comment about Bloomberg covering Bloomberg, but, but I can probably answer the question anyway. Uh, Bloomberg, um, Bloomberg doesn't cover Bloomberg. Oh, is that a policy? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Apparently it's... <laughs> I didn't know that that was a thing a person could do. Um, all right, but... Um, Apparently, not that won't be our policy. Um, <laughs> nothing ever happens. It's like unfortunately, our, our policies were set before this moment. Um, no, so. <laughs> you can't go back. No, now. I, I don't think that that's the right. I, I, don't, I don't think that that's the right approach. Um, <laughs> it's um, no look. The, the team is going to be independent. Um, I mean, uh, you know, for better or worse, we're uh, you know we're uh, a prominent part of a lot of the news cycles. Um, I, I don't think that it would be reasonable to. Um, to, to try to have a news tab that didn't cover um, the stuff that Facebook is doing. And, you know, in, in order to make this a, a trusted source over time, they have to cover it objectively. Now, it's not, they're not going to be writing the pieces. Um, they're going to be basically curating the pieces that other people are writing. So we'll, you know, so the team will get the choice of, of the different content that people are, are, are putting out there. And whatever the kind of the big story of the day is, uh, a lot of the, the job of the um, the, the journalism and curation team will be figuring out, okay, well, which journalists wrote the definitive piece, who uncovered the, the, kind of the, the, the facts here. Um, and, and that's, I think, what they're going to be based on. But, I mean, look, I, I think we're quite aware that um, in order for this product to have credibility and be trusted, um, this needs to be very independent. So, um, you know, so joking aside about whatever Bloomberg does, um, I, uh, I, I, I think that we need to make sure that this, that this um, team has, has kind of free reign to, to make sure that they can include content about Facebook or me or kind of anything else that's related to that. And, and nothing has ever happened to Bloomberg and nothing will ever happen to Bloomberg. <laughs> <laughs> so there's nothing to see there. <laughs> All right, I think we have time for one or two more. Hi, Margaret Sullivan with the Washington Post. So uh, Facebook has been under fire uh, recently for not insisting on truthfulness or even decency in political advertising and, and related content. How will issues of accuracy and quality be settled uh, in what makes it into the news tab? And, and how will you keep um, from the, the refs being worked as I think has happened in the past when, when politically active groups have come after Facebook you know, very strongly and said, you know, we want our, we want our point of view represented and, and it's made a difference. All right, well, well leaving aside the, the judgment on, on, on kind of other areas of, of the product, I have a lot that I could say there, but that's maybe not today's topic. Um, I mean, look, this is, this is a different kind of thing. Um, you know, most of the rest of what we operate on is helping give people a voice broadly and making sure that everyone can share their opinion. Um, that's not this, right? This is a, a space that is dedicated to high quality and curated news. Um, there are very strict guidelines on what it takes to be a publisher that's going to be included in here. We have to have objective standards because um, you, know, you can bet there are going to be questions that different folks have about why they get to be included or not in this um, and making sure that, um, that the content is, is in there, um, that, 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 it's, that the standards are, are clear and objective and part of the standards are that um, you know, the, the content needs to be able to be fact-checked and not have misinformation, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's an important uh, part of the standard here. I, I think that this is, is a different 
people have a different expectation in a space about dedicated high quality news than they do in a space where um, the goal is to make sure that everyone can have a voice and can share their opinion um, and can tell their story um, in whatever the way that, that um, kind of feels authentic and, and reasonable to them. Okay. We have time for one more. All right. Hi, uh, Mark. Excuse me. Uh, hi, Mark Tracy from the New York Times. Uh, kind of uh, on that, uh, one of the uh, I think non-paid publishers that's been getting some attention is Breitbart. Uh, a few years ago, the Breitbart chairman called it a platform for the alt right. So I'm not sure there's that much dispute about kind of some of what they do. Um, given kind of all of what you just said, how this is kind of a curated experience, um, what does adding Breitbart as one of the publishers? What do you hope th that will add to the experience? Well, all right. I, I don't think it. Uh, I don't know if I, I'm going to speak to any specific um, firm in there, but it's. But look, I mean, the, the standards are transparent, like like I just said. I do think that part of having this be a trusted source is that it needs to have a, a diversity of, um, of 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 basically views in there. Um, so I, I think you want to have content that. Uh, that kind of represents different perspectives, but is doing so in in a way that complies with the standards that we that we have for this. Um, the having someone be possible or eligible to show up um, is going to be different from you know what the curators and and the the journalists who who are picking the top stories um, necessarily choose is the most relevant thing to to surface. Um, so I think we're going to have to see a little bit how this plays out. Uh, but I, I certainly think you want to include a, a breadth of, of content in there um, to make sure that all the different topics can be covered. And I would just say as a general point, when we're dealing with hypotheticals, and uh, it's the same with every media organisation, particularly at this time uh, of polarisation and provocation, that we really need calm heads, clear heads, not exploding heads. All right. <laughs> well, that sounds like a good, a good moment to end on.